Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we focus on one of the main police officers in the case, Detective Sergeant Stanley Brian Jones, who played a major part in the wrongful conviction of Jeremy Bamber. Stan Jones, as he was known by most, joined the police force in 1961 at the age of 21. He advanced to becoming a member of the Criminal Investigations Department, CID, in 1963 and earned promotion to Detective Sergeant in 1968. Detective Sergeant Jones worked for Witham CID at the time of the tragedies at White House Farm. Jones retired from the force in 1991, still holding the rank of Detective Sergeant with no further promotions. The evidence used in this episode was obtained from D.S. Jones' statements and interviews in 1985-1986. 1991 and 2002, and from his trial transcript. According to officers at the scene on the 7th of August 1985, D.S. Stan Jones immediately expressed the opinion that he disliked Jeremy as soon as he met him. However, the reliability we can place on these statements is questionable, considering they were all written after Jeremy was arrested. But Stan Jones's dislike of Jeremy did become obvious and appeared to intensify as the case progressed. By the time Jeremy was taken in for questioning a month after the tragedies, it led to a real and tangible friction between the two. D.S. Jones and his colleague D.S.I. Ainsley were both openly homophobic and appeared to pursue a line of inquiry that Jeremy was a homosexual based purely on Jeremy's friendship with homosexual men, including Brett Collins, Jones made no secret of his views when he wrote in a police action that he, Collins, looks like a puff. His personal bias might have had something to do with the difference in class between himself and Jeremy, as they were the antithesis of one another, with Jeremy having had a public school education, attractive to both sexes, articulate, from a wealthy family, and also having had an extremely privileged life. Whatever the motivation was, and however deep his dislike of the young man who had lost his entire family, Jones ensured he was involved with every single aspect of Jeremy's case, including his relentless pursuit of Jeremy, his interference with exhibits, and tampering with evidence to his interaction with all the key witnesses, even when he was off duty. The recent ITV drama, White House Farm, painted a picture for the viewer that Jones was, according to the filmmakers, a hero. The officer who was responsible for revealing the truth about Jeremy Bamber and how Jeremy had plotted and succeeded in killing his family and how Jones was able to bring this mass murderer to justice. And so in this presentation, we will provide evidence to the contrary. That Jones certainly was not a hero, but that he was corrupt and fabricated evidence. And we will discuss this in sections in which we set out. His involvement with unrecorded actions at the scene. Seizing a silencer and inventing evidence. His relationship with Julie Mugford and the relatives. How he tampered with witness statements. How he lied to the City of London Police in 1991 and the Stoken Church inquiry in 2002 regarding his actions. How he attempted to entrap Jeremy. How he manipulated the facts over the course of time. And how he was not adverse to instructing witnesses or to achieve his goal. We recently discovered in the material disclosed in 2011 that Jones admitted to the City of London Police in 1991 that from the outset, He had been looking for something to go and arrest Bam before, and he certainly pulled out all the stops to do so. During his trial evidence, D.S. Jones was asked what Jeremy had been doing when he, Jones, first saw him at the scene. Jones replied, I saw him walking across the fields and he appeared to be being sick. Jones went on and admitted that his very first words to Jeremy had been, 
All your family are dead. You have to be hard and strong. Jeremy had immediately responded to this by saying, You're a bastard. A hard bastard. This remark by Jeremy infuriated 45-year-old Jones, who admitted he then told Jeremy, The quicker you accept it, the better. And if I am hard, it is for a reason. It appears that Jeremy's reaction and comment to Jones's heartless words, within seconds of finding out his entire family had lost their lives, was the catalyst of Jones's then apparent hatred for Jeremy. Was Jones jealous of the good-looking, articulate young man who stood before him that day? The case material now proves that Stan Jones seized a sound moderator, sometimes referred to as a silencer, from White House Farm on the 7th of August 1985. It was allocated the reference identity of silencer for rifle SBJ-1, based on Jones's initials. Essex police deny that this happened to this day. However, the fact was revealed for the first time by the Assistant Chief Constable Peter Simpson at a press conference in September 1985, in which he said, A silencer was found at the White House farm on the day of the killings. But this does not have to mean anything suspicious. Rather oddly, in 2002, the Crown Prosecution Service stated that the beginning of the audio tape, which had recorded this press conference, had a considerable section missing when Essex Police disclosed it. A letter from the CPS said, It appears to be missing a considerable section at the beginning of the tape, which is still blank. Voices are first heard on the tape approximately halfway through, starting at what is clearly not the beginning of the conference and is in the middle of a sentence. Why was the audio recording edited? Was evidence regarding the discovery by the police of a silencer at the farm deliberately edited out? So in total, there was not just the one silencer which was collected by Jones on the 12th of August 1985 and had been discovered at White House Farm on the 10th of August 1985 by David Bowflower in the gun cupboard, but two silences. As stated earlier, the one found at the scene by the police on the day was referenced as silence for the rifle SBJ-1, Stanley Brian Jones. The second referenced as sound moderator DB-1, David Bowflower. Although I cannot discuss the fresh evidence in detail, which absolutely proves two silencers were involved in the case, and had different contaminates which increased over the course of time. Let me assure you, the evidence is substantial and compelling, and will be disclosed in a future episode. While putting together material for this podcast, we chanced upon a piece of important fresh evidence, that D.S. Jones lied. But before we disclose this issue, we must first give you a little more background. Essex police officers have repeatedly denied that they searched the gun cupboard at White House Farm. Those who admitted they did look have either been overly cautious in what they have said in statements, or their statements have been edited. In the vast majority of instances, the handwritten original statements remain locked away in Essex police storage rooms and have never been disclosed to the defence. Every single police officer who attended the scene and who entered the house, who we have the statements from, each deny that they discovered a silencer. But now we have the evidence to prove otherwise. For example, PC Woodcock, a firearms officer who attended the scene, said he did look in the gun cupboard and gave evidence that I saw shotgun ammo and .22 ammo in boxes. He did not apparently notice the carrier bag, which would be later discovered by David Bowflower. Asked again if he had seen a moderator, he said, I am not necessarily trained to see a sound moderator. Rather an odd response for a firearms instructor. Woodcock also said that PC Delgado, D.I. Cook, D.C.I. Jones, 
D.I. Miller and D.S. Jones all looked in the gun cupboard. The important point is that D.S. Jones remained completely silent about this. He never admitted to it in any police statement, and he was never asked why he was looking in the gun cupboard, or what he saw or removed there. It is widely documented that D.C. Michael Clark drove Jeremy home from the scene using Jeremy's car at approximately 10am. However, Jones told the 2002 Metropolitan Police Inquiry twice that he drove Jeremy home. Why would he lie? Was there a reason he wanted to make it appear as though he had left the scene earlier than he did? Was this lie to lessen the likelihood of him being asked any questions regarding finding a silencer or having one handed to him? D.S. Jones was at the scene multiple times on the day of the tragedy, and this is recorded in the scene logs. On one occasion, he was at the house unaccompanied for two hours, but failed to mention this in any of his statements or in his pocket notebook. So what did he do during almost two hours when he was back at the house? Where are the police officer's statements recording what Jones's actions were? Was this when he recovered the silencer recorded as found on the day? We simply do not know. But another question is where did he go when he left the house? Did he go to Witham Police Station, a 20-minute drive away? Or to Chelmsford Police Station, a 30-minute drive away with a recovered silencer? Only Essex Police are in a position to tell us this. But very oddly, Jones turned up at the scene a third time and stayed for 20 minutes before finally leaving to go to Jeremy's home. Jones was obviously highly active at the scene on at least three occasions that day. Yet this first disclosed witness statement is dated the 3rd of October 1985 and makes no mention of his repeated attendance at the scene. Why was this? As it is widely known, D.S. Jones collected the second silencer from Peter and Anne Eaton's home on the 12th of August 1985. On seeing the silencer, he immediately brought a grey hair supposedly attached to the silencer to Peter's attention. A deep scratch is also documented as being on this silencer by Peter Eaton and D.S. Jones, who informed the City of London Police in 1991 that we were at the kitchen table at Oak Farm when I looked at the silencer. I saw the grey hair on a fresh burr about one inch from the muzzle and I thought to myself, I bet that's the old man's. I didn't immediately think there was blood at the end as it was so small, no bigger than a match head. It looked more like a stain than a blob. Interestingly, at no point in this statement did D.S. Jones refer to seeing any paint on this silencer. Why not? The answer is because there was no paint on this or any silencer until weeks later, save for a tiny smear of paint right at the end of one of them. Jones took extraordinary little care of this exhibit and placed it in a kitchen roll tube. Then, after drinking nearly a full bottle of whiskey, much to Peter Eaton's disgust, he simply threw the silencer into the boot of his car. Peter made a formal complaint about this, but the matter wasn't taken any further. Jeremy has also commented that Jones was a drinker and frequently smelt of alcohol while on duty. Much has been made recently about Jeremy allowing bloodstained items from the house to be burned very soon after the tragedy. However, what was not included in the recent drama, evidenced in police documents, was that it was D.S. Jones's idea, and he asked Jeremy to sign a letter of authorisation for this to happen while at the scene. So, whilst the media have claimed for years that this was at Jeremy's request, and that he was destroying evidence, the facts show that Jones was behind this first destruction of exhibits. Jones gave evidence on the 14th of August 1985. He saw Jeremy at the police station and asked his permission to attend White House Farm with Anne Eaton to take measurements. This was an act of deception by Jones, who proved then that he could lie convincingly. 
because the real purpose of the visit was to recover the first set of paint samples from the Argus around. We now know these were taken to match a single smear of red paint found on the end of the silencer David Bowflower had found. The only question put to D.S. Jones at trial by Mr. Rivlin for the defence regarding this issue was about Jeremy's comment to Jones that if they went to the farm, I don't want anything stolen. Jones said he challenged Jeremy on why he said this, to which Jeremy replied he was joking. However, was Jeremy's comment directed at Jones or indirectly at Anne Eaton, who had actively been removing items of value from the house? Jones told the jury he thought this comment was directed at him, thereby deflecting any potential concerns of the jury that Anne might be financially motivated to steal. The first paint sample was taken from underneath the Arga shelf on the 14th of August 1985. Present at the scene were Anne Eaton, D.S. Jones, D.I. Cook and D.I. Miller. In her 16th of September 1985 statement, Anne Eaton said, I clearly remember one of them producing a penknife and cutting a sample of paint from the underside of the mantle. It was either D.I. Cook or D.S. Jones who took the sample. One of them put some yellow-orange sticky tape over where the sample was taken from. While this sample was taken, Jones said to Anne that she hadn't seen anything, a fact she did not disclose until 1991. This makes us wonder if everything was legitimate, or why Jones would have said this to Anne. But it turns out this was not the only time Anne was told by Jones that she had to ignore what the police were doing in her presence. The second time was in relation to experiments conducted on the windows. This evidence was in notes written by Anne, which she used to construct her draft statement to the City of London Police in 1991. Nevertheless, the information was not included in the typed copy of her statement. Robbie, Sergeant Robbie Carr, in the kitchen, got out through the same window. D.S. Jones says, don't put that in. D.S. Jones was also behind many of the witness statements which have never been disclosed but we know exist. Here are some examples. A handwritten note has been discovered which was written by D.S. Jones saying that he should take a statement from Barbara Wilson regarding Sheila saying to her, just days before the tragedies, that all people are bad and should be killed. Sheila also said this to Jean Boutel, the housekeeper of White House Farm, who, according to Anne Eaton, told Barbara Wilson about it. Curiously, none of Barbara Wilson's or Jean Boutel's statements include this information. So it would seem justified to conclude that Jones just did not bother to follow this up. But after all, we must remember, Jones did not want Sheila to be responsible, as he was looking for something to go and arrest Bamba for. A further example is that on the evening of the 7th of August 1985, the first officers at the scene, Buse and PC Mail, wrote witness statements. Buse said in 1986, PC Mail and I made handwritten statements that night, 7th of the 8th, 85, and we addressed them to D.S. Jones, left them either in CID trays or D.S. Jones's office. It is possible that these two missing statements contained information regarding the movement they had seen in the bedroom window at the house. So what did Jones do with these statements? They remain undisclosed. Julie Mugford's mother, Mary Mugford, wrote a single witness statement dated the 3rd of January 1986, which was taken by D.S. Jones. The first time this was seen, because it had been placed under PII, was after the 2011 disclosure. In 2002, for the appeal, Mary told the Met Police, I cannot now remember actually sitting down with D.S. Jones and him writing the statement. I have been asked directly if I have any memory of making more than one written statement to police during that inquiry. I honestly cannot remember even making the statement on the 13th of January 1986. Could it be that Mary had in fact not written it, 
and it had been penned by D.S. Jones. Julie Mugford and Stan Jones became quite the double act as the investigation into Jeremy advanced. Jones met with Julie on at least 32 documented occasions prior to trial, and Jones admitted in 2002 that he, Julie and Anne Eaton had met on many occasions. We believe he was coaching Julie on what to say at the trial. What possible reason could the 45-year-old Stan Jones have for meeting with a 21-year-old female witness numerous times? Jones was the officer who was waiting in a hotel bedroom with Julie whilst the jury were considering their verdict. Remember, if the jury reached a guilty decision, the pre-arranged interview with the News of the World newspaper could commence and a payment of £25,000 would be made. It is odd, though, that Jones was waiting with her. How long had they been there? What had they been doing all the time while she was getting ready to pose in her underwear for the News of the World photographic double-page spread? Jones admitted he took witness statements from all the individuals who would later become key prosecution witnesses, as he set out in 2002. Most of my statements were from the main prosecution witnesses. Jones knew that the Bowflowers, Eatons and Mugford were all equally as determined to not only point the finger of suspicion at Jeremy, but to fabricate evidence to achieve their own individual goals. We also believe that at least one of Julie's statements was written by Jones. What makes us suspect this? The answer lies in the poor grammar, which is unlikely to have been written by a student teacher studying at university. Furthermore, in every disclosed statement, except one, Julie refers to Jeremy as Jeremy. However, in one, Jeremy is referred to every time as Jerry. Only one person called Jeremy by this name. Yes, that's right, it was D.S. Stan Jones. During the 2001-2002 Stoke and Church inquiry, conducted by the Metropolitan Police, in preparation for Jeremy's appeal, the now former D.S. Jones was interviewed regarding several issues, some of which he clearly lied about and some he revealed for the first time. Nevertheless, the Met Police who conducted the interview failed in every instance to further investigate matters or to inform the defence. One issue raised in 2002 was regarding a letter of complaint Colin Caffell had written to DSI Ainsley in 1986 on an important issue about one of his witness statements. Colin Caffell said, I am writing to you because there are a few things which have been on my mind recently which I would like to bring to your attention. The main point I would like to raise concerns a sentence in either my first or second statement. It is the part where I am talking about my conversation with Jeremy at my party prior to the shooting. It refers to an opinion of Jeremy's where he says that he has always felt that I, referring to me, had always had a rough deal with regards to his family, etc. When the typed edited statement was presented to me to read and sign, I noticed that the reference Jeremy had made to me was changed to him altering the whole inflection of the sentence. The I, which is underlined above, was changed to he. When I told Stan Jones this, he said something like, oh, it's only a type in error, don't worry about it. It's correct on the handwritten statement, isn't it? That's all that matters. So just sign it. If you change it, we'll have to have it all typed out again. This has been niggling me for some time and feel it must be important to have been included in the the type statement. When I asked Stan Jones about it again last week, he said, leave it, whatever you do, just don't say anything about it in the witness box. It'll cause all sorts of trouble if you do. Though questioned to some length about this, Jones stated it was a petty matter, and that Colin Caffell had got his facts wrong, was muddled, and that he, Jones, had done nothing wrong. And as he stated to the officers, it was only one word and concluded in arguing about Jeremy's appeal team, stating, 
Can't see what they're shouting for, because it's obviously rubbish. Wouldn't make sense anyway. I mean, it's so petty, it doesn't make sense. Jones had a habit of immediately responding to issues regarding Julie Mugford, even on his days off. There are two examples involving Julie, the star witness. Firstly, when Julie went to visit Malcolm Waters with her friend, Liz Remington, and Malcolm called the police to report Julie implicating Jeremy. Immediately, Jones made himself available to question her, even though he was on arrest day. Secondly, Jones denied being involved in having charges dropped against Julie and her friend Susan Battersby for checkbook fraud and stated in 2002, I did not go with them on that occasion and in fact my pocketbook shows I was not on duty that day. The bank manager gave contrary evidence in 2002 that on Miss Battersby's arrival I also met Miss Julie Mugford and a man who identified himself as a police officer. When he was asked about this, DSI Ainsley immediately named DS Jones as the officer who attended the bank that day, and yet the Met Police took no action against DS Jones for lying. Summing up the main issues he was asked about in 2002, DS Jones showed no respect at all either for the officers interviewing him or for the experienced defence legal team and stated, Right, thanks for that. What I should have said is that they must have had the brains of a rocking horse. That's what I should have said. During an interview in 2002, Jones was asked repeatedly if he had any involvement with the forensics, a question he denied each time and added, I was doing my job getting statements and interviewing witnesses. Um, obviously, I couldn't do everything. The only thing I remember about the lab is going down there for the ammunition, basically. There are no disclosed records that Jones collected any ammunition from the laboratory at any time. In fact, Jones reiterated to the Stoken Church officers that Definitely, I was not involved in anything to do with the hand swabs or anything forensic. A provable lie, because it is now known since the post-appeal disclosure, that on the 29th of April 1986, Jones attended the ballistics department of Huntingdon Laboratory with D.I. Cook, Malcolm Fletcher and defence expert Major Mead, and over a two-day period was present while ballistic tests were conducted. Oddly, neither Jones or Cook made a witness statement to say why they were attending the laboratory on both of those days or what their involvement was. Asked about his knowledge of the position the Bible was discovered in and non-disclosure of photographs, D.S. Jones responded angrily and said, You see, what you've got to think of is, all of that is poppycock, really, because when you work it out, there's no way Sheila shot herself twice and put the gun away, all right? So she couldn't lay the Bible on her body in the first place, right? See, people keep forgetting that. But fresh evidence now shows that Sheila only inflicted a single gunshot wound to herself. The first time Jones has made any reference to Sheila's wounds was in 1991, when he informed COLP when he visited the scene with a pathologist on the 8th of August 1985. He had been surprised to be told Sheila had suffered two gunshot wounds and that, up to that point, I thought there had only been one and I asked where the second one had gone. However, in 2002, the interviewing officers failed to ask Jones about this conflict in his evidence. Had they done so, the 2002 appeal may have had a vastly different result. Again in 2002, when Jones was asked about his knowledge of Robert Bowflower, the inheritance issues and Robert's potential motive to lie, he had to be verbally warned by the interviewing officers not to be rude in his response to their questions. At one stage, Jones began laughing at the questions asked about Robert Bowflower, and for whatever reason, felt compelled to defend the credibility of a witness who we can now prove took all manner of steps 
to disinherit Jeremy, including getting Jeremy's 95-year-old grandmother to change her will after being deceived into believing that Jeremy had also died in the shootings. Jones repeatedly stated that Bowflower was a wealthy man anyway. But of course, we now know that that was only because his wife Pamela had inherited the estates of Mabel Speakman prior to trial, and Neville's, June's and Sheila's estates as a result of Jeremy's conviction. Jones, it seems, couldn't praise Bowflower enough and stated in his interview that all I can say is Robert Bowflower is a country gent, right? Obviously honest as the day is long, and that's all I can say on it, really. I can't add anything to this because I don't know. All I can say is when I've, I've met him, he's been a perfect gent. Straightforward, and he has had a lot of traumatic things happen to him, you know, as a result of this case. Blood samples being taken and accused of, you know, this sort of stuff. And I think he's a real honest gent. A real nice chap. And eventually, in the end, he phoned me up and said, could he? He's worried about this silencer. And I'll never forget. He said, why don't they check that silencer? Because, you know, it's treated as four murders and a suicide and it's not being dealt with properly. He said, was it worth writing to anybody? And I said, he definitely wanted to write to the chief constable. And he did. Nice chap. There's no way he's de devious, or that's my opinion. And Jones concluded by lashing out at the defence by saying, All I can say, they've been wasting their time attacking him because he didn't tell anything but the truth. And he'd have gone to court and he'd have told the truth, whatever it was, because he's that sort of person. I'm not saying everybody is 100% truthful, but all the ones that I've met, met on this case, were, I say, nice people. And they've got nothing to hide. Nothing, you know, all they want really at the end of the day is justice and the truth. And don't we all? And we are now in a position to finally know the truth about what happened in Jeremy's case. Jones was also involved in the fraud allegations against Peter Eaton that had been made by Barbara Wilson in 1987. Put on hold, because Jeremy had an active appeal application at the time. Proving the relatives committed acts of fraud would have damaged their credibility. The fraud investigation was never resumed. It was discovered recently that Jones gave evidence during his interview with the Met Police that a suicide note was discovered at the scene. Jones stated, You don't go hunting for things if you've got four murders and a suicide. You've got someone saying, I've just killed myself. You don't start searching cupboards upstairs. You don't start searching cupboards in the other rooms because you've got a note saying, I've killed myself. So it was treated as four murders and a suicide, completely different. The Met Police and Essex Police were approached for a comment in February 2020 and did not deny the note existed. Had D.S. Jones spoken up about this note and had it been disclosed pre-trial? then it is difficult to believe that Jeremy Bamber would have been convicted. Had it been disclosed in 1991, the City of London Police could have rectified the wrongful conviction. Had the Met Police in 2002 been diligent, they would have realised immediately that Jones had admitted to something of major consequence in Jeremy's defence. However, they chose to remain silent, and this crucial note remains undisclosed. D.S. Dan Jones was involved in each of the interviews with Jeremy when he was taken in for questioning on the 8th of September 1985. For the first three days, Jeremy had no legal representation and analysis of Jeremy's custody records proved that legal representation was refused by the police. By the 12th of September 1985, Jones was getting desperate. He had nothing that connected Jeremy to the shootings. At this stage, all the police had was hearsay evidence of greedy relatives who could only inherit if Jeremy was convicted, and a jilted girlfriend who had a string of criminal offences to answer for. We can now show that on the morning of the 12th September 1985, D.S. Jones knew that his sidekicks, Miller and Cook, were going to the house apparently to take photographs, but the evidence now shows 
that they were there to take a further paint sample. During Jeremy's interview transcripts, it is documented that D.S. Jones attempted to get Jeremy's fingerprints on the Bible. Jeremy told us. On one occasion during an interview, Jones gets up and leaves the interview for a time. Comes back holding what I could see was my mum's Bible. He tosses it on the table and says, Is that your mum's Bible? Pick it up and check and see if it is. I didn't need to pick it up. I knew it was mum's. I'd seen it on the kitchen table probably hundreds of times. I still remember it had a fold in the corner of the cover where the blue ink had flaked off and another tiny fold on the same corner that delaminated the cardboard so you could see eight or ten layers of card. So why did Jones want me to handle the Bible? I knew it was Mum's. Of course, later on I found out that it was discovered in the main bedroom, pushed up against Sheila's arm. D.S. Jones was desperate, knowing he would have to release Jeremy without charge imminently, and during an interview said to Jeremy, you see, the silencer for that gun which I took possession of has, on the end of it, human blood. It also has a grey hair. And see ready coloured paint around the knoll. I believe that the red paint comes from the wall in the kitchen where the stove is. The grey hair from your father. And the blood from one of those murdered. That silencer was found. Firstly, the only way he could have known that paint was present on this silencer and a match for the paintwork at the farm, was because of his knowledge that Miller and Cook had been to the house that morning and the scratch damage had occurred that day. Tests on paint discovered on this silencer were not conducted until the 25th of September, 1985. So D.S. Jones was either psychic or had knowledge of the paint contaminates. He has never admitted to this. Oddly, this was also the first day that Jeremy was told a sound moderator was involved in the case. And witnesses, who reported seeing scratch damage to the mantel shelf, did not say so in statements written prior to the 12th of September 1985. The grey hair was never tested and was not even on the silencer found by David Bowflower until Stan Jones went to collect it. So how could he state it was from Neville Bamber's head? And no blood test results had come back at that time to enable him to say the blood was a match to any of the deceased. This was a deliberate act in a desperate attempt to get a confession out of Jeremy. But in making these assertions, D.S. Jones can now be linked to the manufacturing of evidence against Jeremy. And so to conclude, D.S. Stanley Bryan Jones, the so-called hero of the recent drama, of authors and the writers and filmmakers, has now been taken from hero to zero by his own lies, actions and manipulations of evidence throughout the case. It is maybe fortunate for D.S. Jones that he died in 2014 because otherwise he would be facing many more questions along with his colleagues Ainsley and Cook. Mm -hmm.